And we're live. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here with us today for a very special episode of Secret Jews, Uncovering Hidden Jewish Traditions. I'm sorry, in Uncovering Secret Jewish History. Uh, today's episode is really interesting and it is about, was the Last Supper actually a Passover Seder? Let's go ahead and give our sponsors for the event their due. Uh, first of all, the very uh, compelling documentary who is uh, somewhat based on the family history of our very special host today, The Secret Jews of Calabria Uncovering Jewish Hidden Traditions for Over 500 Years. I encourage all of you to visit rabbibarbara.com and go ahead and order that, especially around the holidays. These uh, historic events are always nice to share with our families and keep the traditions alive. Rabbi Barbara Aiello, Italy's first woman rabbi. The list is very long, but we'll do our best. Jewish interfaith and same-sex marriages, bar and bat mitzvahs, vow renewals, baby namings, workshops, lectures, and interviews, as well as virtual guest appearances. For more information on Rabbi Barbara Aiello, please visit rabbibarbara.com. The William David Company, producers of The Secret Jews, um, and I am the CEO of that company, Dr. Randy Ross, and, and we think it's so important to understand as any kind of business entity today, you don't get a second chance to make a first impression. To, so to find out more about what we do as sponsors and producers of this event, visit williamdavidcompany.com. Well, your host today is a very, very special, unique person, Rabbi Barbara Aiello, as we said a moment ago, Italy's first woman rabbi, uh, first and, and only female rabbi in Italy, uh, the first synagogue you'll see in 500 years. And Rabbi Barbara, um, as we just said, is the first non-Orthodox and first and only woman rabbi in Italy. She serves as rabbi for, and rabbi, if I mispronounce this, I'm sure you'll correct me, Nir Tamid Del Sud. Did I do that right? That's right. Nir, <laughs> Nir is, is, is uh, eternal Tamid, Nir Tamid, eternal light, yes, of the South. Okay. I try, but sometimes I don't always get that accent right. Mm. The eternal light of the South, the first active synagogue in Calabria in 500 years since the Inquisition times. As director of the IJCCC, Italian Jewish Cultural Center of Calabria, that's a mouthful, Rabbi Barbara serves those with Italian heritage to help them discover and embrace their Jewish roots. In addition, Rabbi Barbara is the host of the Radio Rabbi program, which is broadcast every Sunday morning at AM 930 um, in Sarasota, Florida. The program features Jewish traditions, culture, music, and its live stream podcast. And if you have Rabbi's app, it plays in there, as well as on her website around the world, and has been part of the Tampa Bay media for over 14 years. Rabbi Barra is a featured speaker, scholar, and residence for synagogues and organizations throughout the US, Canada. And recently, she was a featured speaker at the National Press Club Newsmakers Program in Washington, DC. And I can tell you, we were there, and it was an amazing program that she presented. Uh, she's also been a presenter at the Bahrain Religious Pluralism and Tolerance Project hosted at the one and only United Nations in New York City. Rabbi Barbara is a graduate of Indiana University of Pennsylvania, where she received the Distinguished Alumni Award. She holds an MS from the George Washington University in DC. And following her participation in Hebrew Union College para-rabbinical program, she received rabbinical ordination from the Rabbinical Seminary International and Rabbinical Academy in New York City. Well, I got through that without stuttering too much. And without any further ado, we're going to bring on to welcome our host and presenter for today's program, Rabbi Barbara Aiello. Welcome, Rabbi. Well, thank you. Thank you, Randy. And uh, Shalom. Erev Tov and Hag Purim Sameach to all of you. It's almost the holiday of Purim. I'm so happy to be with you this evening. And uh, we have a wonderful topic. I'm pleased to talk with all of you about an idea that has confounded historians and theologians, but surprisingly, it has united many Jews and many Christians. And that is, was Jesus' Last Supper a Passover Seder? 
good time of the year to talk about it with Easter coming up this Sunday and Pesach, Passover coming up a little later on in the month of April 22nd. We'll present some of the prominent ideas, some of the obvious connections and controversies, and as is the Jewish way, allow you to draw your own con conclusions. Let me start by saying that there are several good books that will give you details about Jesus' life from the historical and theological point of view, and I know that among our listeners tonight and our visitors here and participants to the hangout are Christians as, as well as Jews and so um, if uh, I'll try to be explicit and uh, and uh, detailed so everyone can understand what we're talking about but let's get back to the books for just a second the ones that I think you'll find uh, interesting if you want to pursue this and other topics related to the life of Jesus one is zealot the life and times of Jesus of Nazareth by Reza Aslan Rabbi Jesus, an intimate biography by Bruce Chilton, and the Eucharist words of Jesus by Joaquin Jeremiah. At the end of our presentation, we will have these on a screen for you if you'd like to copy the copy the, down the information and maybe read on. So for our purposes tonight, though, we are going to examine three events in Jesus' life that relate to our topic. And let's start first with the ancient painting from the Byzantine period probably done in the late 13th century and probably done in Turkey. Let's take a look at that now, the presentation in the temple. Now, what we're seeing there is what in Jewish tradition is called the covenant of Brit Milah, the covenant of circumcision. Now, in some Catholic communities, it is a holy day of obligation on January 1, and it is called the Feast of the Presentation. And that occurs, interestingly enough, eight days following the birth of Jesus, according to Catholic tradition. And uh, and and we see in the picture the, ta the table. Let me just take a look. Yes, we see the table, and uh, and and the mother holding the baby, and uh, and this and the person doing the circumcision would be a moil, and that person would be may, would be. Be, be circumcising all baby boys in the temple, and of course Jesus, as a good Jewish uh, baby, uh, born of good Jewish parents, would have had the opportunity to have fulfilled that mitzvah, the mitzvah of the covenant. Now let's take a look as Jesus gets a little older now. The, the, this one is called The Boy Jesus Preaching in the Temple. It's painted by Max Lieberman in 1879. And historians and theologians agree that Jesus was about 12 or 13 years old when he was missing from his mom and dad. They, they had started out, they had gone, left uh, Jerusalem, gone home, and after a day's travel realized their son was not with them. They turned around, went back, and asking around, they found out that there was a child prodigy preaching in the temple. 12 or 13 years old and when Mary and Joseph entered the temple what they saw was their boy leading a discussion of Torah well that would have been Jesus becoming a bar mitzvah being called to the Torah bar meaning son mitzvah meaning commandment and Jesus being the son of a commandment would have come forward and uh, and and preached in the temple giving his devar Torah reading from the scriptures and and explaining them to to the elders surrounding him and that's what that's what you see what you see there why are they so amazed well Jesus came from a very poor part of Judea there people were um, uh, not literate they were uh, not educated and Jesus was considered to be by some theologians a child prodigy and this was remarkable for a young man coming from where he came from with the parents he had to be able to to do the job that he that he was doing in the temple the next one is really fascinating, and this is a piece that was produced by a carver, his or her name, unknown. It's an ivory plaque, and it is often said to be the depiction of Palm Sunday, but actually it is the festival of Sukkot. And the festival of Sukkot, when Jesus came into Jerusalem riding on a donkey and everyone waving palms, actually took place in the month of October 
during the festival of, of the tabernacles, or as is called in the in in uh, in Torah, the Sukkot. They are waving the palm branch, sometimes a bouquet of uh, of myrtle and willow and palm, called the lulav, and with an etrog or a, uh, a large citron citrus fruit in hand. And uh, what happened? The reason Palm Sunday precedes Easter is a um, uh, was liberties taken by by uh, by Christians at the time wanting to attach Jesus' arrival in Jerusalem uh, to a uh, to a festival. Actually, the festival took place in October, so the festival of Palm Sunday uh, was actually the festival of Sukkot. And now, finally, let's take a look at the famous. Rabbi, Painting can it. I just in, uh, yeah. I just want to ask you one question? You just mentioned yes. the citron, and if I remember correctly, in the DVD, the the documentary "Secret Jews of Calabria," aren't those grown in a part of Italy? Absolutely, the cedro or the etrog is uh, grown in Calabria. It is at the same latitude as Jerusalem, and there are only two places where uncultivated etrogim grow, and that is in uh, Jerusalem, and it is also in Calabria. As a matter of fact, Orthodox rabbis come from all over the world to pick the fruit of the of the the godly tree, as they say, and looking for the perfect fruit with the uh, with the stem a certain way, the point a certain way, because there are blessings that we make when we hold them and shake them and move them up and down. And then, then we put the, the etrog at our, to symbolize our hearts. The fruit actually has, it is not a circle, a circle, but it's more of an oval and it is reminiscent of the shape of our hearts. So yes, indeed, that is that is very true. And let's go to Leonardo. Oh, there's Leonardo's, Leonardo's famous painting of the Last Supper. As a matter of fact, if you come to Italy, come to visit me. I'd love to love to have you. But stop in Milan first, and that's where you can see the original painting by Leonardo da Vinci. Now, could this meal, which is remembered by Christians as Maundy Thursday, which in in and of itself has an interesting uh, interesting background in terms of its name, Maundy Thursday is also known, of course, as Holy Thursday, Covenant Thursday, Great and Holy Thursday, Sheer Thursday, and Thursday of Mysteries. Why Maundy? It has to do with giving alms, and that is one of the traditions of Passover, giving sadaka, giving charity. And, uh, and, and that's one of the clues, one of the clues that we have that the Last Supper could have been a Passover Seder. Now let's talk about Passover here for just a moment. It means order of blessings, prayers, stories, and symbolic foods to explain the exodus or the Jews' escape from Egypt. And the Seder meals that we are most familiar with, we find a Seder plate and a special book. And I want to show those to you right now. Here is a teaching Seder plate. Here we go. Can we get that up on the screen there? Okay, I'm going to see if I can. There we go. Okay. Probably move, it, move it back a little bit. Okay, here, how about go. that? Okay, <laughs> this is a teaching Seder plate. It is chinette, okay? And uh, so it can be used maybe a couple of years, but not for too, not too many. And it has the indentations to show us where to place the symbolic food, where we place the beitza, the egg, where we, put, where we place the, 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 uh, the bitter herb, the maror, uh, uh, maror, where we also, where we place the uh, parsley, the carpus, where we place the haroset, and where we place the zaroa, the shank bone, or the lamb bone. And these are, there are all kinds of Seder plates. As a matter of fact, we'll talk about some of those in just a moment. But the, a Seder plate with the words in Hebrew, English, transliteration, or all three pictures or not are a part of the Passover Seder. Another part of the Passover Seder, and I'm sure you remember this, is the Manashevitz Haggadah. Here we go. Let's look at this one. Let's look at it this way. 
how we doing here? The Manashevet Sagada. And uh, these are uh, these were complementary for many, many years. They still are. A Hagada is a Hebrew word that means the telling, the telling of the story of Exodus and the order, because Seder does not mean meal. Seder means order. So in the Hagada, we find the order of the prayers, the blessings, the stories, the songs, and the symbolic foods to make the story of Exodus come alive. And all Hag all Haggadot are not the same. Here is one. Here's a really nice one. And uh, this this is uh, has the 12 tribes at the front. And it's illustrated beautifully, as many of them are. Some families make their own Haggadah. They make their, they make their, their own special family Haggadah. And there are many, many to choose from. And as a matter of fact, I have quite a collection of them. But back in the time of Jesus, is the festival of Passover featuring the Seder meal was much less elaborate. In fact, it was an informal affair with each father telling his child in his own way and in his own words, while children spontaneously interrupted dad in his presentation asking all kinds of questions. The Passover Seder was a vehicle for, for performing the four biblical rituals, the mitzvot that we Jews are commanded to do on the evening of the 15th day of the Hebrew month of Nisan. So what are these four rituals? And these are the basics long before the elaborate Seder came along. Well, each pa eat to eat the Paschal offering. That would not be brisket. That would not be tur <laughs> that would not be turkey. It would be the ro the roasted lamb. And as a matter of fact, in Italy, which of course dates its Passover seders back way back to Roman times and and beyond. There, it, you wouldn't think of having anything else but roasted lamb on, uh, 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 at the festive meal on pa on Pesach. Uh, you would eat it with maror, uh, and, and the bitter herb would be would be lettuce, of course, and haroset, that mixture of apples, nuts, and wine. If you're Ashkenazi, or if you're Sephardic like me, dates and figs and oranges and uh, and apples as well. And you would eat it with unleavened bread, of course, called matzah. In temple times, in the era in which Jesus lived, Passover night centered around the Paschal offering, making ample use of the abundance of spring lambs. This ritual has long since ceased, but for the past 2,000 years, the paramount symbol of Passover has become Da, 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 da. the matzah that's right the matzah but if as you're looking on your screen you will see that the matzah from Strites is a little bit different from the matzah that you see on your screen which is the way matzah looked in and was eaten very irregular and round back in uh, back in uh, temple times and uh, and also um, the uh, the matzah that the Jews uh, the Jewish women carried on their backs as we escaped from slavery in Egypt were large sheets they had to be tied onto their backs so it was a lot different from the matzah that uh, we are all used to <laughs> unpacked packed packed in, packed in the box after the destruction. Of the temple, the Seder, which, by the way, is an Aramaic word for order. Aramaic is very interesting because that was the language that Jesus spoke. He did not speak formal Hebrew. It was not a spoken language at that time. Yiddish is a combination, of course, of, of Hebrew and German. And Aramaic was the language of the family table of the marketplace and of the street. And Seder is an Aramaic, Aramaic word, and it means order and so after the destruction of the of the uh, of the of the second temple the seder evolved into its co in its common form a form more recognizable to us today interestingly 2,000 uh, years ago, when our rabbinic sages lived under Roman op op occupation, when they were developing the Passover liturgy that we follow today, these sages not only incorporated directives from the Torah, but get this, but also from the Greek and Roman symposium. Now, the word symposium is a Greek word for drinking together. 
That's what it means. Did you ever go to a symposium? <laughs> if you have, and you were actually following, if you were actually uh, interpreting it literally from the Greek, you would drink together, drink alcohol. So I, what? I think we've all been to a lot of symposiums if we've been to college. But, oh, we may have. We may have felt <laughs> like drinking, right? Yeah. <laughs> so what did they add? They added the elements of these Greco-Roman intellectual gatherings. So. In, because of the, the 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 Roman and Greek influence, there were directives from the Torah about eating the the Paschal offering and the uh, and of course and and the and the and the matzah, and um, let me just uh, to and and the bitter herbs and the haroset and the and the unleavened bread. Those were the basics. Now they were adding things to what to um, to create what we would recognize as today's seder, reclining on couches, ritual hand washing dipping hors d'oeuvres, several rounds of wine, followed by a sumptuous meal, a series of questions to kick off the after-dinner discussion, and voila, the Seder was born. Now, the first Seder plate was not a plate. It was a basket called a keara, a, a, called a keara. A keara, I want to pronounce that correctly, a keara. And it made its own special entrance. The, the, the basket was not on the table when the guests arrived. Instead, it made its own special entrance. And it was passed from head to head on the people around the table to symbolize the heavy burdens that we Jewish people uh, carried when we were slaves in Egypt. And in Italy and Greece today, at the Passover Seder, the Seder plate is a basket and it is passed from head to head. Isn't that interesting? Rabbi, because what's in the basket? Is it different than what we put on the Seder plate today? Um, well, again, the in the basket would be in, in probably little uh, ceramic dishes or little, in, in Italy now, glass containers. There would be, uh, we do not dip parsley, but we dip celery. And uh, there would be the vinegar. We dip celery into vinegar as opposed to parsley into salt water. Um, uh, both me both have the same meaning, the bitter tears that we Jews cried when we were slaves. And uh, and then there there would also be the um, the the lettuce, the the uh, the bitter herb, the the uh, horseradish, the har the haroset, the shank bone, and the egg and the roasted egg, which of course carries over into Jewish traditions. The idea of the cycle of life, birth, life, and death. The roasted egg is symbolic of springtime and a new beginning. And that, of course, made its way into Christian traditions. And you find it in your Easter basket. Well, was the Last Supper a Seder meal? Now that we've discussed the elements of the Seder, both um, historically and, uh, in, in, and, and from the point of view of modern times, and we've talked a little bit about Jesus' life as well, uh, let's take a look at the Seder meal and see, see if we can uh, ascertain if it could possibly have been a Passover Seder. Well, some use the Hebrew calendar to say no. And as a matter of fact, I got a very interesting email from uh, from uh, one of my uh, followers on, on Facebook who felt strongly that it could not have been because of her calculations looking back into the ancient calendar. Um, and when those, and she's not alone, there are others who believe it could not have been a Passover Seder for that reason. And they cite that the date of the first day beginning of course, the first day of the Hebrew month of Nisan. Now, when would the first day begin? On the Hebrew calendar, the day changes at sundown, not at midnight, not at midnight like we're used to, but the changes at sundown. So those who believe that, that the Last Supper was not a Passover meal state, that the date of the first, of the first day of the Hebrew month of Nisan, beginning at sundown, of course, could not have been a Seder because it was Shabbat. And we know that throughout the ages, heir of Passover or the eve of Passover has fallen on Shabbat. Some people believe that, it, that that Passover could never have fallen on Shabbat, but that's not true. As a matter, as a matter of fact, heir of Passover this year is on, is, uh, is on Shabbat, the first Rabbi, Seder. Rabbi, just watch your notes are covering your, your camera. 
Oh, oh, excuse me. <laughs> excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, I'm new to this. I'm very, I'm very, very new to this. Um, others say it could not have fallen on a Thursday because Jesus would have been killed on a Friday, but not taken to the tomb on Friday night because a burial would have broken the Shabbat. Those who disagree say that, that especially their number of historians, uh, they believe that this is exactly why the Romans buried Jesus on Shabbat. Jesus was thought to be a heretic and not a real Jew. So one way to show the utmost disrespect would have been to bury him on the holy day of Shabbat. But the arguments reg regarding the Hebrew calendar lose the arguments lose some of their steam because back in the time of Jesus, the calendar correction, the addition of the month of Adar too, had not yet been formalized. And so that the that is that is the correction for leap for leap year. So it is impossible to pinpoint exactly what day of the week or date on the calendar the Last Supper actually occurred. Now, it wasn't until 400 of, of CE of the Common Era that there was a fixed number of days in all the months from Adar to Elul, thus confounding any calculation of the actual dates that, hap that occurred before 400 CE. Now, author Joachim Jeremiah in his book, which we'll show you in just a moment, The Eucharist Words of, G uh, of Jesus, talks about 14 parallels to uh, to to the uh, the Passover the uh, Passover uh, Seder and the Last Supper. So let's exa examine some of these, and you see what you think. Well, the Last Supper took place in Jerusalem. Yes, indeed, uh, that's important. Uh, it was a pilgrimage holiday. Jesus needed to be there, and that's where it happened. It was in a room made available to pilgrims for that purpose, and that's important too in the upper room because as people gathered in Jerusalem to celebrate Pesach, to celebrate Passover, they needed a place to hold their Seder. And so the upper room was a place a, a place that is not given any particular um uh, any particular description of whom it, of to whom it belonged or a house that Jesus was visiting in or living in or the the home of one of the disciples instead it was it was probably a room made available to pilgrims at that time of the year also it was held at night the meal was held at night because main meals were often held during the day Jesus celebrated the meal with his family of disciples that's important too, because uh, because his 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 disciples were known as his family all throughout the uh, the evangelical gospels. While they ate, and the and the um, uh, the Last Supper painting by Da Vinci confirms this, they reclined, and the meal was eaten in a state of ritual purity. In other words, hand washing was part of it. Bread was broken during the meal and not just at the beginning. Now that's very important too because it was the middle matzah that was broken during the meal. Not, um, uh, not, not, be not before. And of course, when was bread broken for Shabbat? Many, many of those who believe that the Passover Seder could not, uh, uh, the the Last Supper could not have been a Passover Seder. Say it was actually Shabbat, and in reality, the challah would have been broken at the beginning of the meal. There, are, if you take a look at the um, at the matzah from the olden days, I wonder if we can bring that back up, Randy, for a second. Sure. Okay, let's take a look at that matzah, because we know that Jesus was speaking and saying he took bread into his hands and broke it, and uh, and and gave it to his disciples. Well, that's exactly what we do with the matzah. We break it and we pass it around, and we make a special blessing. We make a blessing which Jesus would have made because we know that Jesus was a learned, a learned Jew. He would have been able to, to a very more than adequately lead a Passover Seder. There are others who believe that the um, that the shape of the host of the Eucharistic host is a derivative of the matzah, the round matzah used at that time. Well. Another reason, according to according to uh, Joaquin Jeremiah, is he says that why wine was consumed and the wine was red. Now that may seem a little strange to you, but not actually, because wine generally was white, and the reason was, if you thought you had to stretch the wine, you could water it more easily. 
you could add some water and it didn't look watered red wine looked watered red wine was saved for only very very special occasions and there were last minute preparations for the meal after which alms were given and we know that Maundy Thursday Maundy means alms giving as a matter of fact even in modern times today silver Maundy coins are considered to be coins that are given as um, as as charitable contributions uh, Jesus and his disciples remained in Jerusalem that why is that important because Passover is seven days eight days in the diaspora seven days and Jesus dis discussed the symbolic significance of the meal just as Jews do during the Passover Seder let's take a look at the books again here so that uh, so that you can uh, you can write these down if you like There we go. Zealot, the life and times of Jesus of Nazareth, and Rabbi Jesus, an intimate biography by Bruce Chilton, and the Eucharist words of Jesus by Joaquin Jeremiah. These are just a few, just three of many, many books that discuss the topic. And if you are interested in uh, reading more about the life of Jesus, leading up, of course, to the Passover Seder, and uh, what we, what, you, what, what Christians would call Holy Week, you might find this very, very interesting. Now, regardless of whether or not the Last Supper was a Passover Seder, Passover plays a crucial role in understanding Christianity and the man who Jesus was. The Gospel of Matthew in chapter 5 reports that Jesus said, Do, Don't misunderstand what I have come. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish their person, their purpose. And we know that Jesus was born, lived, and died a Jew. And from his birth, to, through his life and to his death, Jesus was respectful of Jewish traditions, observant in the temple, and learned. All in all, Jesus was a good Jewish man. So there you have it. And uh, if you have, um, you can you can make up your mind about whether or not the Last Supper was indeed a Passover Seder. And uh, do we have any questions, um, Rabbi? I wanted you to share something that you and I spoke about last week that I thought was interesting for a Seder. For those of us that don't like Manischewitz wine, uh, because we're we're wine connoisseurs. Tell us a little bit about how you said all wine from Italy is kosher. Yes, indeed. That is a very interesting story because in, in Italy, back in the late 1600s, two vintners were fighting over who, produ who produced the most kosher of their two kosher wines and they were they were trying to convince the rabbis of Rome each one that his was one was better than the other well things got out of hand they were sabotaging each other's vats in the night passing around horrible gossip and as the uh, as the argument uh, la guerra e, cre e, e cresciuta as the as the war grew between them finally the rabbis made a decree and they said that all wine in Italy is kosher and in the synagogues today if you go into the kitchen you'll see this little pronouncement often framed in a beautiful little ornate frame that reminds anyone in a kosher kitchen that all Italian wine is kosher so if you don't like Manischewitz you can have a nice Valpolicello and be completely kosher <laughs> well that's what we'll be serving at our Seder this year well Rabbi thank you so much uh, for a wonderful story to share with us and to give us all a, a little bit of uh, food for thought, things to think about that maybe don't always enter our conversation, and a great conversation for our Passover table for this year. Well, you were have been watching Was the Last Supper, a Passover Seder, an episode of Secret Jews, Uncovering Hidden Jewish Traditions. Keep an eye out on your emails if you're on Rabbi's email list. If not, you can go to our website and sign up and to make sure that you get messages for all future and upcoming events. Well, that's all for tonight, and we'll see you back here at the next story. Shalom. Bye-bye. <laughs>